Friends, uh, I mentioned some time ago I would be looking at some old favorite passages that I, and messages I haven't uh, spoken about in quite a while. So you're going to hear one of my favorite texts from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 38th verse. Listen to God's word as it comes to us from the Gospel writer and by God's spirit, a living word for us this day. Now, as they were on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to, to, to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And gracious God, break open your word for us this day as we ponder it that our own lives and hearts and minds would be rearranged and aligned with your will for us and for us in the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a favorite old story. A Michigan woman was vacationing in a small New England town, the same town in which the handsome actor Paul Newman often vacations. One Saturday, she gets up early for a walk. When she gets home, the craving for a double-dip chocolate ice cream cone seizes her. So she hops in the car and drives straight to the old-fashioned soda fountain in the drugstore in town. Well, as chance would have it, the only other customer was none other than Paul Newman, sitting at the counter with a cup of coffee. The woman's heart skips a beat as she glances, and that glance settles on the celebrity's baby blue eyes. Newman nods graciously, and the star-struck woman smiles demurely. But she quickly tells herself, you're a mature 50-year-old woman, not a teenager. So she turns to the counter as the store clerk fills her order. She takes the double chocolate chip cone in one hand and her change in the other, simply nods at Newman and goes out the door. When she reaches her car, she sees she has change in one hand, but the other hand is empty. She says, where's my double dip ice cream cone. My chocolate cone. I, I must have left it in the store. Back inside she goes expecting to see it there on the top of the counter in the little cone holder and it's not there. She glances at Newman and he breaks into that familiar warm friendly grin of his and says you um, put it in your purse. <laughs> That's what I would call distracted. Our text today tells of another woman, Martha, who is, as Jesus says, distracted, and of her sister, Mary, who is sitting, listening to Jesus. The traditional interpretation of this text suggests Jesus tells Martha to stop what she is doing, unimportant stuff, and sit down like her sister at his feet. Jesus does, after all, commend Mary for having chosen the better portion. Some scholars add perhaps it's the timing of the event. Jesus is moving closer to his crucifixion. Perhaps there's a sense of urgency about his being in their home, and, and he doesn't want either of them to miss out. Maybe so. As colleague Joy Strom interprets the text for today, Martha, dear Martha, you are distracted by many things. You and I should know this chastisement. Most of us understand Martha's predicament. Today's Martha would be checking texts and emails and eating lunch while at stoplights. She could be on a treadmill scheduling tomorrow's appointments. She could be grading papers while on a speakerphone with the family letting them know she'll be home a little late that evening. She could be on a Zoom meeting in a crowded airport juggling a watery Diet Coke and her laptop. She could have a baby on one hip and a textbook for night class on the other. She could be receiving chemotherapy on her lunch hour, trying like crazy to keep her job. She could be overscheduled, overbooked, overwhelmed. 
The urgent demands of life collide with the urgent demands of the gospel. And anyone's trigger can be tripped. Martha, dear Martha, we know you well, for you are many of us. Distractions and worries abound in life. Perhaps there is good news here in thinking Jesus would call us to stop. Stop what we're doing and, and listen. And that could be news, good news for, for many of us, whether we're kitchen workers or floor sitters. There's, there's need of only one thing. But if everyone only sat at Jesus' feet, what would get done? I mean, what would ministry look like if, if all we did was sit around and meditate? You know me, I could talk for days. <laughs> but much gospel work has happened over the centuries because there were a lot of Marthas along the way. I mean, think about what took place behind the scenes here this morning. Glenn was practicing the organ early. The bells were setting up. A custodian cleaned bathrooms, turned on lights and unlocked doors. An usher put water in, in this glass behind the pulpit in case I, I need it. Lynn was firing up the live stream. Someone turned on the soundboard. Jerry was making sure that the HVAC was running correctly. Dozens of things were already happening before worship even began. Is it possible Jesus could be saying something here besides stop, look, and listen? Note this. Jesus doesn't say anything about food or kitchen or hospitality. But he does have some very strong words here. Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. The first word he uses also in verses like, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food or the body more than clothing? The other word here in the Greek is turbadzo, from which we get the word turbid, to, to be disturbed, to be troubled. The word's only used once in scripture and it's here it has has the meaning of, of you're distracted beyond reason you're all worked up over nothing Mar Martha you are you are really stressed out I know certainly there are times when Jesus would use that word to describe me describe me when I'm, I'm so stirred up or anxiety ridden that I, that I lose the ability to monitor myself to problem solve or to focus how many of you have ever said to somebody you seem angry and their response comes in loud voice fists clenched steaming coming out of the ears what makes you think I'm angry I wonder if there's another message for you and me in this text not that Martha is necessarily doing the wrong things but that she is not content or at peace with what she is doing. She's become hassled and jealous and resentful, all worked up. The gift of hospitality she planned to offer Jesus is no longer a gift, it's become an obligation. And then instead of confronting Mary directly, as we would say in today's psychodynamic language, she, she triangulates, she goes through Jesus to try to get him to confront her sister. Maybe Jesus isn't criticizing Martha for doing kitchen work instead of listening to him. Maybe he takes her to task for being worried and distracted not only by what she is doing, but by what others are not doing, by her less than gracious thoughts that have arisen. Maybe it's not her activity at all, but her attitude. 
Jesus hears her complaint not about being overwhelmed in the kitchen. It's about unfairness. Mary gets to sit at your feet and I don't. Martha is caught up in another person's business. Tell her to help me. Jesus will have none of it. As Jesus knows Martha has lost her original intent. After all, it's Martha who invited Jesus to her home in the first place. It's Martha who wants to be hospitable and maybe is seeking something from the master, but she's forgotten all that. Tell Mary to help me in the kitchen. Jesus sees through the surface and, and knows her need. Martha, you're anxious and troubled. You see, perhaps the contrast is not between doing or listening, between, but between being anxious and not. How often in church are you and I distracted from the real reasons we're doing something because of what others aren't doing? I show up at every church event. Why don't they? I make every choir rehearsal or band practice. What, what's her problem? I sing every verse on every hymn. Why doesn't he ever open his mouth? I've served on six committees. Why can't they do their part? How often we forget the very reason we do those things. To grow in our understanding of Jesus Christ so we might better love God and neighbor. You ever had this experience? You invite folks over for dinner and then spend the evening running to and fro from the kitchen to the dining room, from the fridge to the grill to the counter, from the pot holders to the corkscrew, heating the pie, getting spoons for the coffee. When the evening is over, you stand at the front door and you're saying goodbye to all your guests and you realize that's the most conversation you've had with them the entire night. When our inner spirit and attitude is distracted or worried by the work, we lose the spirit of its purpose. And forget that so much of what we do is to be a vehicle for feeding the deeper hunger within our soul. And soon we begin to complain, comparing other, our work to others, and, and, and jealousy and resentment and burnout tend to, tend to creep in. Jesus didn't bust on Martha for getting dinner. It is only Martha's, only when Martha's labor of love becomes a cry of pain that Jesus questions its necessity. I suspect if Martha had simply gone about with her work and, and laid out a decent spread, Jesus would have done as Jesus always did. He would have sat down and enjoyed it with gusto and reveled in the conversation with both sisters. And if Martha had done no serving at all, eventually people would have started to get hungry. And then perhaps Jesus himself would have headed into the kitchen and found some bread and broken it. In Carrie Fisher's book, Postcards from the Edge, the main character sends a postcard home from the vacation she's on and she writes in the postcard, having a wonderful time, wish I was here. <sighs> Too often we miss what God has for us because we've gotten so worried and anxious about other things that we cannot see. If you and I censure Martha too harshly, she may abandon serving altogether. And if we commend Mary too profusely, she may sit there forever. There's a time to go and do, a time to listen and reflect, knowing which and when is for all of us a daily matter of spiritual discernment. But remember even more, in both circumstances, you and I can find ourselves loving and serving Jesus because after all, he is present with us in all times and in all places. It just takes the right attitude to see him. May it be so for us this day. Amen.